Hi everyone, welcome to Metaphysical Mining. I've got a special treat for those of you who know Jerry Marzinski and are familiar with any number of his interviews posted online. Not only do we discuss his book and his 35 years of research, but he talks for the first time that I'm aware of in depth on his experience with shadow people. And we're only at the tip of the iceberg, folks, as Jerry has agreed to come back for a second show and share everything he's got on how these shadow beings haunted him and his schizophrenic patients. But for now, here's a little teaser. Enjoy. We are officially recording episode two. This is the Metaphysical Mining Channel. My name is Michelle DeVries. It is Monday, February 21st, 2022, and my guest is a retired psychotherapist with over 35 years of experience counseling paranoid schizophrenics in state mental institutions, state prisons, and hospital emergency rooms. We have a lot to discuss. Welcome to the channel, Jerry Marzinski. Good to be here. Before I hit record, we were talking about a ton of things. Hopefully we can remember what we were talking about and bring that up. But just so everyone's on board, the reason for the channel is that it's a supplement to my academic career. I was recently awarded my master's degree in metaphysical science in December of 2021. And I established this channel so that I could speak with people like Jerry and talk about how I used his book and his research in the paper. Where did I use it? How did I use it? Why did I think it was relevant? And because we're constrained on time, Jerry, if it's okay, I'm going to jump in to some slides and get this out of the way. It's a very top level overview of the paper and that way we'll all be on the same page. Okay. The title of the paper is the hidden predator deconstructing the shadow side of reality. And this is the official thesis statement. And then this highlighted portion is where, Jerry, your research and your personal experience actually fits in to the statement. And then when I go through the table of contents, the audience and you are going to see exactly where I inserted and used your information as well. So basically, the paper reveals the subtle predatory ruling intelligence that is embedded within the fabric of our reality and how humanity interacts with it often with dangerous and even deadly consequences. I'll prove that just becoming aware of the shadow archetype of our reality can be a catalyst for an evolutionary growth process of the mind, ushering humanity into another plateau of awareness. And then I say, when you stand on this other plateau, you go through a paradigm shift and you realize that humans are not at the top of the food chain. And I'm sure that Jerry, you can agree with that because you say that exact thing on page 140 in your book. And I'll get to that too. Very true. We yes. are not at the top of the food chain. So I want to define what we mean by hidden predator. And this is an explanation of what I used in the paper, but then also Jerry, if you could explain after I go through this, what is your definition of, of this hidden predator within the paper? I define the hidden predator as an independent, invisible, non-material, non-human, ancient predatory race that shares our planet, lives in a parallel reality, and exhibits a high degree of social and psychological agency. We probably won't get into this, but I do go through that there's a hierarchy. They have a defined set of rules of engagement because this reality is very controlled. There has to be checks and balances. When you enter this reality and when you interact with human beings, it has to be under control. That way nothing gets messed up for them because our whole society is set up in a way that it benefits them. And if something's going to enter it, it better not mess up that benefit. Now, the reason why I say that is because it appears they're governed by laws that supersede our human laws. And the reason why I say that is because in the first part, of the paper, it's the review of literature is broken into two parts and you'll see that in a second, but they seem to be able to come and go as they please. They interact with us on their terms, essentially. And not only can they travel between our realities, but they can take us to their reality and bring us back if they want to. Sometimes they don't. And that's definitely not something that I'm aware of. I don't know if Jerry is, but I'm not aware of us being able to teleport or bilocate. That is the very brief description of the hidden predator in the paper. So Jerry, if you want to give your definition from all your years of experience, what is your definition of hidden predator? Well, the number one fits almost exactly, you know, they are independent, they're uh, invisible. 
They are non-material. They are of the energetic universe. They're not of the physical universe. And the energetic yes. universe, there is no time. There is no space. And there is no material. There's no matter. They dwell in that universe. So they can hit a schizophrenic anywhere at any time, no matter where they go. I mean, they can go, you know, to Antarctica and they can mm -hmm. still hit them. Their space and time doesn't matter to them. They are predatory. They can only consume negative emotional energy. They can't make it themselves. So basically what they do to us is like what we do to cows. You know, they set us out, we eat food, we drink milk, we, we produce emotional energy. Mm -hmm. For them to take it, they have to turn it negative. And then they take that negative emotional energy and they suck it out of the people. So, you know, schizophrenics will tell you they can feel their energy leaving. They can mm -hmm. feel that they're drained after the voices attack them. They have to make us edible first, because if you're in a good mood, that's not something that's edible. No. And, and so no. a bad mood. So it's like, I liken it to, you know, we have different species on this planet that eat absolutely appalling and disgusting things like a vulture, a vulture will sit around and wait for something to rot. <laughs> that is what it finds palatable. Well, we have to look at this consumption in a different way because this predator, it's terraforming this environment to get a product, you know, from a business perspective, we are a commodity. And it has to alter us in the way in which it wants to produce this product. What has to make us ferment and be this, this disgusting putrid thing before it's like the vulture, before we actually become edible. Is that correct? Well, that's pretty close. What, what okay. these things do, the, the schizophrenics call them the voices, mm -hmm. okay? Psychiatry is going, ah, there are no voices. These are hallucinations. So, I mean, that's bull crap. That's total yeah. bull crap. The schizophrenics have been trying to tell psychiatry forever that these things are very real what the, what they do is they're, they're consistently negative derogatory insulting you know, to the individual they will jump on any negative situation and inflame it and and they're they're kind of like magnetism you 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 can't see the magnetic energy you can see the effect mm -hmm. you know when you put that that magnetic field under iron filings or in a jar you can see the effect that magnetic field has mm -hmm. on those iron filings these things are pretty much the same thing. You can see the effect they have on schizophrenics and they don't just get schizophrenics. They get all of us to different degrees. You know, you're walking around all of a sudden this horrible negative thought comes into your mind to do something you would never do. And it's shocking. And you go, where did that come from? That doesn't belong to me. That's not mine. But it upsets you anyway. That's an example of being hit by these things. But schizophrenics get hit constantly all the time. They, they run these patterns that I sent you. You know, and yeah. we've, we've defined some 28 of them. If psychiatry would look at these patterns, th th they couldn't miss them. I yeah. mean, th their hallucinations don't run patterns. So psychiatry, big pharma, you know, are making a ton of money selling toxic drugs to drug the brain, which doesn't mm -hmm. do anything except calm these guys down temporarily. As soon as those drugs wear off, the voices are right back. They're again. right back there. Well, I'm glad you brought up that list. I'm going to go to the next slide because... We'll get into that when we get into the self-defense aspect of it and what you came up with and your experience. This is basically the table of contents of the paper, the introduction, review of literature, discussion, and conclusion. And then the review of literature is broken into two parts. And we were just talking before I hit record on how part one talks about the macro view of how this predator drills into and operates within our environment. And missing 411 cases, time storm cases, that's something that goes across the planet. It doesn't matter where you're at, who you are, you can be affected by this. And then part two is where I go into the micro. I go down to the individual. How is the individual dealing with this? And then the section where you and Sherry and Paulino are, you guys, in my opinion, are textbook examples of how this predatory archetype acts as a catalyst to push you into another state of awareness. You're forced to access the metaphysical environment so that you can survive. And that is essentially a paradigm shift. You're forced to see more of the matrix than the rest of everybody else does. So you are literally pushed out of you know, this bubble of this matrix and you guys are floating in this other bubble as you're watching everybody else under this spell. You guys are out here 
dealing with the dragons that are coming and going between this main matrix and everyone else is just completely oblivious to it. And that's why I look at your work as self-defense. It's psychic self-defense. You're warning people, you know, I see these things. I see what they can do. I've come up with a scenario in which you can survive it and you can combat it. So that's why I lumped all of you guys together. And Paul Eno does the same thing, but you guys had to go through it first in order to teach somebody about something and really know it. You have to go through it yourself. That's right on because when I was finding all this stuff, there was nobody I could talk to about it. I couldn't talk to anybody on the psych staff. I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't talk to my wife because she'd get all freaked out. Oh, you should be dealing in those things. Nobody except the schizophrenics. They were the only ones who understood what I was (laughs) talking about. I know. Like, I, I, I was listening to an interview of you once, and I'm like, this guy got up every day, showered, drank his coffee, kissed his wife, and he went to a prison and worked with schizophrenic prisoners. I got up every day and went to my cushy advertising job. You had wolves at the door. I didn't have wolves at the door. I was in this cushy environment. And then here's Jerry with these inmates that are violent criminals. And you were dealing with the human predators that are metaphysical predators were influencing. I was fascinated with what was going on, but for years, I I just got like pieces of the puzzle, you know, Mm -hmm. and I go one year, I go, well, I got this piece now. And then I got this piece now. And, and, you know, there were times where I just got so fed up with dealing with schizophrenic, you know, after, after the seven years at the state hospital, I got into a PhD program and I'm finally, finally, I can get away from these people. No more, no more. Cause they were driving me nuts. I, 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 I was determined to find out what was going wrong with them. And it was just one piece at a time. Maybe one year I'd get one or two pieces and next year I'd get another couple of pieces. And I, and I had all these pieces of the puzzle and I was like, Oh, I can't take this anymore. And then, you know, after I, I, got done that PhD bull crap. I was thrown right back in again. It's like some mm-hmm. big hand goes, where do you think you're going, buddy? No, it's, it <laughs> Get was, you back in faded. there. You and Sherry were both faded to handle. It's, it's like you came into this life with the, the level of maturity, the cosmic, whatever new age, you damn words you want to use, the cosmic universal maturity to deal with this archetype. I honestly am convinced that somebody like you actually came in with this knowledge. And now you're, you were just remembering it. You were getting triggered by all these things. And it was cellular memory coming up. You were tapping into your human technology and you needed this epigenetic trigger to happen. And you were like, okay, now I remember. Now I remember why I'm here and what I'm supposed to do. I know this predator and I know how to deal with this. I I can kind of feel that, but I suspect I was drunk at the time I agreed to do this. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, it's like, that's how they were like, Jerry, this is what you're going to do. Have a yeah. shot of tequila and we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it was unbelievable. I mean, just, uh, you know. But you held your own. You held your own. And, you know, like I said to Sherry, I said, Sherry, you were three, four, five, six years old when you were dealing with this archetype. I said, and look at, look at the, the people Jerry was treating. These are grown men and women that couldn't hack it. And I'm not saying anything against them. I'm not trying to be condescending, but look at what Sherry was a child. And she was swinging at this archetype and battling it. And look at how she came out. She's this warrior. And then, you know, some of these people that you dealt with, yeah, they, they couldn't swim. They, they, they sank. They could not swim with this predator. They could not spar with this predator on the mat in the predator's dojo. And here comes Sherry and Jerry. You guys are just battling this predator your whole lives. When, yeah, and, while much. you're around people who can't hack it, you're trying to pick people up as you're swinging, you know, you, you get a good punch in, somebody falls down, you try and pick them up and you're still swinging. Yeah. Well, th- thinking mm-hmm. back on it, I, I had much more trouble with the prison administration than I did with oh, the yeah. psychotic killers. <laughs> they drove me crazier than the prisoners did yeah. by a long shot. All right. Just... Well, let, let me bring a picture of your book up so that people know this is what you co-wrote with Sherry Sweeney, An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind, Breaking the Spell of the Ivory Tower. I'll put all these links in the show notes so you don't have to stop and write this down. I'll make sure everything's down there. I'm going to stop share right now. We're going to get into what happened in the prison system. I want to read from your book. This is page, let's see, 69 through 
71. This is the actual story that got me to say, this guy's in the paper. Okay. While working in the psychology department of the state prison, I was in close liaison with a specially chosen group of schizophrenic inmates. I collected information about their voices with the intent of destroying them if possible. The voices didn't like me prying. Several inmates told me the same. I found it interesting that their voices told me to shut up and leave my office as I already knew too much, an odd behavior for what was supposed to be a hallucination. If the inmates refused to leave, their voices got louder and ordered them to attack me, which we will talk about that too. This situation occurred frequently and required much mutual trust. As methods to interrupt the voices improved, inmates began to report that their voices were growing increasingly upset with me. One of my patients who was improving with the exercises given him came to my office to tell me his voices were demanding to speak to me personally. This had never happened before. After getting over the shock, I asked what they had to say. His voice tone changed slightly and these words spewed from his mouth. You have no right to interfere with our way of life. This was not the patient who had spoken, which he instantly affirmed that wasn't me. It was at that point that my battered denial system completely collapsed. This is what got me. I could no longer pretend that the voices were not entities separate from the patient. An unshakable sense of dread came over me. I sensed I was treading on dangerous ground. And I actually put that quote in the paper. Stunned, I canceled my appointments for the day. My mind lapsed into a wild storm of thought and emotion as I tried to sort out what the hell was going on. Though I long suspected the voices might be real, I would not allow myself to fully acknowledge the reality of their existence. This is like you working through your paradigm shift. I could no longer deny that the voices were entities with a consciousness separate from that of my patients. This is your awareness expanding at this point. My theory that the voices were deranged figment of their subconscious minds had to be discarded. Whatever these voices were, they weren't anything good. A few weeks later, while reading a book written by a shaman, I came across a passage in which he spoke of the existence of invisible parasitic entities that fill our minds with negative thoughts and commands, then consume the negative emotional energy generated. I brought this book into my office, then called the inmate whose voices had spoken to me. I asked for his opinion about what the shaman had written. Shortly after I began reading the passage, he lapsed into a trance-like state. He stared at me with hollow eyes. Suddenly, my office walls began to resonate with a loud electrical crackle, similar to an arc welder, which is what a lot of people in time storms report. The crackling moved around the office, up the walls, across the ceiling, back down into a Rubbermaid trash can next to my left leg. I looked into the trash can, nothing was there. The episode left me terrified and uncertain of what else they could do. Until that point, I believed that whatever the voices were, they were stuck inside the patient and could not manipulate physical matter. It took me two months before my curiosity overcame my terror enough to call the patient back to my office. I asked him if he had heard the crackling that day. I did, but it surprised me that you did, he said. So what was that? I asked, they were the voices. What were they doing? They wanted to scare you away. Well, they did a damn good job of it. Where I previously viewed the voices as malicious, sinister, cunning, and sometimes stupid, they now left me feeling that they were capable of terrorism. And then you say, Sherry refers to them as entities, alien thoughts, sees them as disingenuous morons. The medical establishment insists that they are all hallucinations. Well, hallucinations don't produce electromagnetic fields that attack you. <laughs> Does it take you back to that? And well, you know. it took me. It took me back, and you know, I, I even got goosebumps because yeah. that's where my denial system completely, completely <laughs> fell apart. It was already tattered. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody else would have probably went, "Hey, these are entities." Years yeah. before, but at that point, it was like boom. It went down. I was in shock. That you know? is your paradigm shift. That's why I chose you to be in the paper. You were the perfect person at the perfect time in the perfect situation. No one else could do this, but Jerry Marzinski. Well, I'm not sure anybody else would want to do it. <laughs> that, again, it had you gotta to be, be a you. Bit, you got to yeah. be a bit crazy to do exactly. this. You know? it's like, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so what are we talking about here? We're we talking about someone that looks like a, a UFC fighter. Well, the image of him is, you know, he's a little bit overweight. He always was unshaven. He, he was one of the groups. And I didn't work like this with all 
criminally insane schizophrenic prisoners. It was a carefully chosen group. And the agreement was that I'll do everything I could to help them out, you know, to, in, in any way I could and work with them. But the, the deal was they had to tell me in real time when the voices were present and mm -hmm. what they were saying. Now, was this something that was approved? By Hell like, no. no, get okay. out of here. You okay. gotta be, that's what they that's what they went after me for that. OK, I got gotcha. you. So you you're know, basically what, doing this on your own, tr uh, trying to help these individuals. Right. And okay. then when they found out that they were actually recovering, yeah. fully recovering mm -hmm. and wanted to go off their meds, that got the attention of the psychiatrist there that this isn't supposed to happen. They're supposed to be schizophrenic for the rest of their life. And the meds are the only form of treatment. And here are these people completely recovering. Their voices are gone. They don't want the medicines anymore. And mm -hmm. that came to their attention. And then I was put in into an inquis inquisition. They started putting me under investigation mm -hmm. for experimenting with prisoners without the departmental permission. Basically, gotcha. all I was doing was asking them questions, and they were going after me with a hatchet, and none of the prisoners I worked with gave them any information. What are these crimes that these people committed? What level is this? Is this maximum security? Well, I was doing this throughout all the different security levels I worked at, so they were different different levels. And like I said, I was carefully choosing the people I worked with. Yeah. Does this predatory archetype go after more of the violent when it's in the prison system? Well, there, there are two factors, and, and these, are, these are founding factors for schizophrenia. One is, is intense physical, psychological, and emotional abuse. They're attracted to a negative mindset with negative emotional energy. And the, the other one is methamphetamine. More okay. prisoners went insane on methamphetamine and stayed there than any other drug I've ever seen. It does something to the wow. spiritual protection. It just blows it wide open and lets mm -hmm. these things in. So one of the MOs could be, it looks for methamphetamines, which could go along with that theory where I say they need you to be rotting flesh. And meth would probably do that. Like All I can tell you is the way it happens is okay. so they start using meth for a while. They feel great. They feel like Superman. They have a lot of energy. They can get a lot of stuff done. They're just, you know, boom, 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 like Superman. And then one day they start hearing voices like it's allowing these negative entities in. It breaks down whatever spiritual defense the person has and allows them right in. So they start hearing voices. They go, oh, that's just a hallucination. It'll go away when I get off the drugs. And it does. Mm -hmm. And that might go on for, for months. And then one day it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. They're hearing those voices without constantly, the meth, right? without the meth, without oh, anything yeah. for the rest of their lives. It's like once they made contact, then they were almost tagged. Like we tag an animal and we track it. Right. It's right. like they were tagged and then they can just come back and feed off of this person over and over and over and over and again. over. And, so, and what's even yeah. stranger is they would tell these meth patients, the voices would tell them where and out and when to be there. And if mm -hmm. they showed up, the drug, somebody would come along with the drug. What was so, interesting yeah. is they knew stuff that the patient didn't know himself. And it was all for the destruction of the patient. So the patient, mm -hmm. you know, the, a meth addict, he, he goes, finds meth. That's great. He's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, they tell him which houses to rob and they get away with it. They love that, mm -hmm. you know, even though they're thinking this is great. It's actually destroying them. The, the, the prisoners being destroyed through this love of meth and mm -hmm. money and robbery and and, you know, they've shut down all the state hospitals, then they throw them all in prison, you know, because how are they going to survive? They can't they can't hold a job. So yeah. they rob people. They take stuff. They throw them in prison, which is the worst possible place. Oh. There's no treatment. They only yeah. give them any psychotic drugs if they're causing problems. Otherwise, they, they lock them up and, and they're brutalized. They, the, the gangsters will actually force a psychotic patient not to take his antipsychotic drugs, then they'll get this guy all paranoid and they'll say, hey, this guy on the rival gang, he's, he's looking to kill you. You better oh. knock him off first. So they'll they'll send him like a human torpedo in, and then he gets a life sentence and he's in there for the rest of his life. The ones who don't get that way and eventually left out or, you know, they do they do their their time. Their time's over. I've mm -hmm. seen them release prisoners that I knew they would kill somebody in six months, but their time was up. Their death yeah. to society was over. Yeah. So they brutalize these guys. They harden them in that environment. They get more violent. They get nastier. They get mm -hmm. uglier. And then they release them on society because their time is up. 
I do remember when I was younger, there were still state hospitals. It started with Proposition 13 in California, where they went, hey, you know, our taxes are way too high. We, We need to do something. What they did is they closed down all the state hospitals. So these, and they go, oh yeah, we're going to institute mental health centers. And these guys are going to go to the mental health centers. No, they don't want to take those drugs. They hate those drugs. The voices hate those drugs. And the voices will tell them these drugs are poisoning you. And they'll point to the side effects of those meds. And they'll say, well, look, you got dry mouth, sexual dysfunction. You're, you're nervous. You're, you're, you know, all all these akinesia, you you know, the the shaking, the quivering, all, all these horrible side effects. And the voice to say, look at that, the psychiatrist is poisoning you. And when I first got to the state hospital, I noticed that psychiatrists were getting beat up by schizophrenics at a horrendous rate. It wasn't anybody else. It was a psychiatrist. It wasn't the psych nurses. It wasn't the regular doctors. It wasn't the counselors or psychologists. It was a psychiatrist. And I didn't know why. I noticed it. See, that's what I'm talking. One of, that's, a, that's a piece of the puzzle. You're seeing yeah. a pattern and you're the only one that's like, uh, everybody, what's going on here? <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah. don't worry about it, Jerry. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You know, <laughs> they, they go, well, that's just a symptom of schizophrenia. That's it. They blow it off. Nobody was curious about what was happening. So so what was the reason why they were being attacked? The psychiatrist. Well, see, I didn't know that until the after the seventh year. Oh, wow. Um, you know, so I noticed they were being attacked. I didn't know why. And I didn't okay. know why they weren't attacking everybody equally. Yeah. Yeah. Like the orderlies. And, yeah, you know, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, they were attacking the orderlies but, but at, you, the, but, at the same rate as they were attacking the psychiatrists, but the okay. orderlies are with them 24 yeah. hours a day. Correct, the psychiatrists yeah. are there 20 minutes. Yeah. And, I'm, so, and it I'm was thinking, a disproportion, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, what the hell is psychiatrists saying to these guys that are uh, getting them to, to attack them in 20 minutes? It, it, it does not compute. That's pretty astounding. So you know? this, this was my seventh year at the state hospital. I was about ready to go back to graduate school again. And there was one gal who she was doing great. She was in cosmetology class. And if they didn't take their medicines back then, they, we knew nothing else. You know, we knew nothing else. We were taught in graduate school. Medicines are the only thing you can do for these people. Their, their brains are broken. They got a, a chemical brain imbalance. They made this up out of, out of thin air. There's yeah. no proof of a chemical brain imbalance. It's a matter of fact, it's been staunchly disproved and they're still pushing this bull crap to sell their toxic drugs. They don't care about helping people. They're caring mm-hmm. about making money and, and just dumbing these guys. Mm-hmm. They're not looking for the cause. They're treating symptoms. It's yep. bull crap. It's just total bull crap. The whole Western mental health center, me- mental health philosophy, it's crap. It's crap. Mm-hmm. So this one gal, she went off her meds for the third time. We were about Mm -hmm. to discharge her because, you, well, you're not staying on your meds. You're not going to be able to function. So her mother calls me and says, you know, don't do this. I can't deal with her. I, you know, I'll I'll come up there. We'll talk to her. We'll find out what happened with them. And I felt so sorry for this mother that I said, okay, okay, we'll, we'll hold up on it. Come on up and we'll pull her and we'll talk to her. So the mother came up, we brought the patient in. And, you know, both of her, both of us are going, you were doing great in cosmetology. You knew that you're going to get discharged if you stop taking your drugs another time. This is the third time, three strikes, you're out. And then mm-hmm. we, we discharge you because you're obviously not going to cooperate with the medicine. And that's all we know to keep you sane. You know, and I said, and we're both, the mother and I are both asking, why did you do this? Why did you do this again? You've been warned before, you know what happens when you stop taking your drugs, you go crazy. Mm -hmm. You you can't function, all this horrible stuff happens. Why did you do it? And she says, you won't believe it. You know, you won't believe me. I said, try me. I've seen a lot of weird things here. I said, it's going to take something real special to kind of throw me off the game. And uh, she said, okay, you know, the voices. The voices wow. told me the psychiatrist was poisoning me. And they pointed to the, the nervous effect. They, they, they pointed to dry mouth and blurred vision and akinesia and, and, and twitching and, and, and all the horrible effects and saying, they're poisoning you. Yeah. And now, was, said, this, was this the first time you heard somebody say the voices? Was that the first time? Say the voices? Yeah. yeah that's yeah. the first time I heard that. Okay. I knew the voices didn't like the medicine. You know, I, I knew that because they, that's the first thing they go after. Because what it does, the only thing it does is calms these people down. And remember, their game plan is to get them as upset, as feeling as guilty, as depressed, as rotten, every negative emotion that they can elicit to generate that negative emotional energy, which they then suck off. 
These drugs are basically major tranquilizers. They calm them down. It makes mm -hmm. it much harder for the voices to upset them when they're tranquilized. And they don't like that because then they start starving. And on top of that, then, then they can start communicating and relating with other people. The voices don't want them to have any friends. They don't want them to have any families. Yeah. They don't they want, want them, them isolated. They want completely. them totally isolated. Yeah. So they can bash them and then drain them. That's the worst thing for a schizophrenic patient to be is isolated, like they are in a prison. Yep. Yeah. And I actually go into, um, I think it's the first, or I can't remember what section it is, but Susan B. Martinez. She wrote the field guide to the spirit world. She's in the paper as well. And she goes into a lot of depth about this isolation and she does research into serial killers. She has a lot of really good graphs in her book mentioning how they were isolated because of this or because of that. And then they knew they were trained to isolate their victims. It's like they were taught this behavior by this predatory force, and then they started mimicking it. So mm -hmm. it's another form of behavioral science. <laughs> they're teaching them how to perform and then they're getting them to do these acts. And then they're feeding not only off of the person doing it, but also the victim as well. Exactly. And, um, yeah. I don't know if you've read William Baldwin. Yes. He, yeah. So I have a bunch of books back there about the spirit attachment therapy and the spirit release therapy that was going to go into this paper. I decided to put in my PhD but he was at the prison system. He was working with females and he said he was doing a lecture and he was talking about how these spirits can cause you to do things. Yeah. And the, one of the girls came up to him at the end. I'll never forget it. It's like the one thing I'll always remember about his work. This, this female prisoner came up to him and said, do you think that these things can possess your body, commit a crime and then leave? And he yes. said, yes, I 100% think they can do that. He said, all this weight dropped off of her. She was like, I knew it. I knew for the life of me, I could not have ever committed that crime. The only thing she remembered was she was a severe drug addict. She was in a horrible situation, a drug house. She said, all I remember is I did whatever drug it was. I blacked out. The next thing you know, I woke up, I was on top of somebody and blood was everywhere. She said, I knew she said, and, and it, it, like it's given me the goosebumps because even though she was in this horrible situation, this horrible thing had done to her, she said, now I know my soul is at peace because I knew I couldn't do that. And I knew I didn't do that. And I knew my soul didn't do that. And I was like, holy shit. How profound is that? Yeah. I remember the first time I ran into that. It was a, a, a psychotic patient who was hearing voices before he got into the prison mm -hmm. and the voices had convinced him. They, they, that they're they're after they hate human beings they hate them they hate they hate us and they convinced him to drive out into the desert with a gun and when he ran out of gas to get out of the gun and shoot himself wherever he ran out of gas oh wow okay so he gets his gun he, he drives out in the desert he runs out of gas gets his gun leaves the car walks out into the desert sits down on something a rock cocks the gun and he's he's going to shoot himself and he said this bird came out of nowhere and it's a bird that he never recognized before and he lived mm -hmm. in arizona he said it was just the strangest looking bird and mm -hmm. it started screaming at him so what he said is he cocked the gun he shot at the bird and the blast of the gun woke him up and here he is he woke up with a gun in his hand and he's going what was i going to do you know wow. it was like that it's like the gunshot woke him out of that trance so so they they actually put these people in a trance mm -hmm. and then they do this stuff and a lot of them don't remember the horrible things they do matter of fact i can put you in in touch with a, a woman who's the mother of a psychotic killer okay. you know she one of her 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 youtubes is on my website and she talks about what that was like you know mm -hmm. with her he killed i think four or five people he, wow. he, he killed his murdered his girlfriend cut her up into little pieces and they still have Jesus. not found her body she's got videotape of him it was her mm -hmm. son he's wow. in a maximum security prison and uh in Colorado right now, but she tells she tells the story of what she went through with mm -hmm. all that. She's got uh, he was completely taken over. Mm -hmm. You know, he 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 was he was the voices, and that's what the voices try to convince the person to do, because you know we're, we're we're taught from the time we're little kids that all the thoughts in your head that come into your head are you. They belong mm -hmm. to you, that they are you. 
you know, but they're not. If you if you're the one who can sit back and listen to the thought, you're not the thought. You're the one yeah. listening to the thought. You're like you're, the watcher, you know, you're, the you're, observer. You're the watcher. You're <laughs> yeah. the watcher. You're the observer. You're not the thought. And these voices come into these people's heads, and they're intrusive. They 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 sound just like the person's normal voices, normal thoughts in their head, but their intent is very much different. So they start struggling with this. Like, what is this? What are these voices? And they'll come to three different conclusions. And the conclusion they come to determines what their chances of, of full recovery are. The ones who come, come out of it the best are the ones who keep the voices at arm's length. They go, I don't know what you are, but you're not me. You're dangerous. You're infesting me. You're, you're telling me to do things I don't want to do. You're not me. And, and mm. they, they keep them at a distance. The second most successful ones are the ones that don't know what the voices are. They don't know whether it's them or not them and eventually come to the conclusion that they're not them. The, the very worst, the ones who succeed the least, the ones who stay psychotic for the rest of their lives are the mm -hmm. ones who believe friggin' psychiatry that these things are hallucinations, that their brain is broken, that they have a chemical brain imbalance, that they don't have any proof for, mm -hmm. that the voices are hallucinations, voices that they've never studied. And it, it's a phenomenon they've never experienced. They just arrogantly get up there and go, we're psychiatrists, we're the priest. These are hallucinations because we say so and we <laughs> went to college. You know, <laughs> God damn. Uh, that's got to be so as hell. frustrating because it's, it's frustrating. It's like, really frustrating. You like can't a, talk to them at all. No, no, I, they, they're, they're gone. They're completely no. gone. Well, thank God for you, Jerry, that, that you know, no. you, you kind of dealt with all this and still stayed with, with a level head. <laughs> And, well, and I don't just know how level my it. head is. Yeah, I was like, going to say. <laughs> um, like I said, I must have been drunk when I agreed to this. <laughs> okay, well, I do, I do want to talk. I want to ask you some questions because you brought up the physical symptoms. And then we talked about the environmental, the epigenetic type of things that can come in. I'm going to go through some of these time storms. Um, some of the time storms data that Jenny Randall's compiled. And I want to see if it fits with what you've seen and what you've experienced. Yeah, so, because I, I don't know anything about time storms. I mean, uh, I my theory, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing what I believe her theory is, is that these predatory, like your parasites, we can call that we can separate them. When you tell the patient they're parasites, they go nuts. Oh, they yeah. go absolutely crazy. You, you, you better brace yourself if you, you point that out. Yep. They're being mm -hmm. blocked from seeing that. And I remember times where I'd say, if you stuck your hand in a fire and you got burned a million times, and every time you stuck your hand in the fire, you got burned, what's burning you? They had no trouble saying the fire. But yeah. I say, if you hear the voices a million times, and every time the voices come, you're drained of energy, where's your energy going? Their answer was consistently among hundreds of them. I don't know. I don't know. They were being and blocked from access to that information. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's like they're, they're mind controlled. I say in the paper, this is an advanced form of behavioral science. This is almost like MK ultra on steroids because these beings have thousands of years of doing this. I mean, they, yeah. they've been growing us, cultivating us in a sense. This is a farm. I go through the different scenarios of rules of engagement of how they interact with this reality. And it's like, we're a lab, we're a farm, we're all these things all in one. And so if you want to come here as a predator and you're a scientist and you want to tag some humans and you want to monitor them, then you come through on a license. Like we, we have licenses to drive cars. We have licenses to hunt. They have to have a license to come in here because this is a very controlled environment. This is a patented technology. It's very expensive. They don't want you messing it up. So if you come in here, you have to be um, approved to come in here and hunt as this predator. You have to come in under the license of uh, snatch and grab. That's what I call one of them is snatch and grab. The other one's catch and release. And the other one is sink or swim. And your personal experience is a sink or swim. And that's where the predatory archetype works with you as a shaman in a sense. They're working with the human being to develop them, to take them into a situation where you go through an alchemical transformation. Now, somebody that's in a catch and release, that would be the hierarchy up, up top the echelon, which is more of our scientists, where they come in, they monitor the population, they make sure that we're healthy, that everything's okay. So they'll tag some of us. They'll manipulate the environment. 
they'll get you into a state they'll like literally these time storms it's like a fog or a mist and it'll come around and it can lift you up it's lifted up cars so imagine that in the missing 411 you walk into one of these time storms and you're gone you go into their reality they do whatever they want they bring you back they wipe you they drop you sometimes there's been cases where people have been dropped some of these human mutilations, I've gone down that rabbit hole, which nobody talks about that. It's very like much what? like the cattle mutilations, but it's human mutilation. So we don't even have to go there. But, but so with these time storms, I feel that these predators, they understand advanced science. They understand atmospheric science because they're manipulating the environment to physically take us and bring us back or to put us into altered states of consciousness so that they can do whatever it is they need to do with us. And the witnesses in time storms, everyone's pretty much survives it. So their testimony says that they, they encountered a strange cloud, a storm like mass, mists, luminous glows or orbs, fogs, vapors. And these are in different colors too. They're black, white, gray, green, yellow. It's the full spectrum. Temperature changes, that's big severe hot, severe cold. It's the full spectrum of temperature changes, electrical odors. Like when you're in an, in an elevator and you're like, ah, oh, it smells like electricity, buzzing, humming, rushing sounds, electrical popping, which is what you had, the vibrations, change in pressure in the air so much so that they pass out. People have literally passed out in time storms. One guy was on a motorcycle. He had leathers on, I think it was in Britain and he's on a motorcycle and it's raining. So he's wet. Okay. His leather's wet. He went through the time storm. He heated him up so much. He was dry and his leather, you know, how like when you heat up leather, it gets smooth. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. Thank God he had the leather on because he probably would have burned his skin and other wow. people do report a radioactive type of burn and they get, they get a sunburn and, afterwards. You know what that triggers me off is when I went, when I, after I stopped working in the prison and went to work in the private sector in the emergency rooms doing psych crisis. I could feel these things. Even, even at, in my later years in the prison, I could feel when those, those voices were active, when they were angry. There was no other feeling like it. It was like this electrical, uh, icky electrical feeling is the best I okay. can put it. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it had different strengths. So if it, it, it measured how angry these That's things were and mm -hmm. how strong they were. So I could tell how angry they were and how strong they were by this icky electrical feeling that I had. And there were times where it was so strong, I felt it was going to just destroy whatever protection I had around me. I always felt like I had a, you know, a, a field around me like Star Trek, where they have that protective field. But boy, there were times where it was so strong that it, it was just pushed like a billionth of an inch above my 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 skin i'm like what happens if it breaks through and and they couldn't fool me because i'd i'd ask them you you've been, you've been hearing voices and they'd say no and i say oh yeah you have and this is how yeah. strong they are and they're active right now and the mm -hmm. guy would go well how do you know do you hear voices too cool. it's dangerous to talk yeah, to people it about is. it and that's what the voices say too yeah. you talk to anybody about this they're going to lock you up and drug you man they're nobody's going to believe you you know oh. so they they said don't talk about us don't mm -hmm. tell anybody about us you know Okay. So another atmospheric thing is timelessness and stillness and silence. And some people in the missing 411 have reported that the birds stop, the insects stop. I know you're in a hospital, but you have, a, have you ever physically felt an odd stillness because you are in, a, you know, and especially in a hospital, it's very look, busy in emergency room. So do you ever feel timelessness or stillness at all? Let, let me tell you, you're, what you're saying triggers one event that I'll yeah, never that's forget. That's why I'm bringing this stuff up. You so. know, <laughs> it's like I was working in the emergency room, the, the mm -hmm. county hospital. It was a Christmas Eve. I got stuck on the shift there in the, in the ER and it was pretty quiet. There wasn't a lot of stuff going on. And in comes this guy who is just shaking. I mean, he's just mm -hmm. shaking. He's quite, he, he just doesn't stop shaking. And I pull him in, start doing a psych eval on him. And he said, well, you know, I, I, he started telling me about the voices and uh, he said, he's been using meth. I said, how long you've been using meth? He said, I've been injecting meth for 10 years. And Holy I'm thinking cow. like, you should have been dead. Eh, buddy. What are you wow. doing still alive? I'm thinking in the back of my head. So I'm curious mm -hmm. about this guy now, you know, so I'm like, 
oh, what's going on here? You know, which is something I always did. Why, what is going on? Why is this doing? How come this is, you know? So, yeah, how is so, he surviving this? How is he know? surviving? So <laughs> I started talking to him about the voices and, and the meth. And he said, yeah, I'm still using meth. I use it for 10 years. And I said, well, have you ever seen the shadow people? And he goes, yeah, I've seen the shadow people. And I said, what color eyes they have? Well, he, he goes, uh, uh, red. So the shadow people, the, the psychotics see them, mm-hmm. methamphetamine addicts see them. They're, they're usually human shapes, you know, and their eyes like are silhouettes, either, you know, almost like, like, a silhou- like, yeah. like silhouettes are darker than the rest of the room yeah. and they can see them at night. They can go through walls. Their eyes are, they either have no eyes or their eyes are red or, or lime green. They can, they can pass through walls and, and they, they never talked to the best of my knowledge. I haven't heard one patient in my whole career up to that point where they said they talked. And I'm asking this guy about his uh, shadow people. And, you know, I, I run all this stuff by and I said, have they ever spoken to you? And I figured, well, if, if they speak to anybody, they'd speak to this guy. And he said, mm-hmm. yeah, they have. And I said, what did they sound like? And he comes up with this real screechy, you know, it's like hey, real screechy, uh-huh. you know, yeah. mimic. And it just sent shivers up my spine. And, you know, and then I, st- I started asking him, I said, what did they tell you? And all of a sudden, his eyes changed. They became dark. And, and he just, he, he went complete, he, from shaking all the time, you know, mm. quivering, he went yeah. stark still. And I'm looking in his eyes, and his eyes were dark. Oh. And it was like these pools of hatred that went forever. And this thing is, it wasn't him anymore. Mm-hmm. It was this entity that was just like evil as him. hell mm-hmm. that was looking through his eyes. And I'm looking at it. And one thing I knew is you can't show fear. So I'm staring at this thing and it's staring at me uh-huh. and, and I'm like, God, I can't take this anymore. And it seemed like it lasted forever, <sighs> you know, and I'm staring in this and it was these dark oh, pools yeah. of hatred. It was just like this, yes. this cold hatred that just went forever and you could just feel it radiating out. And I'm staring at this thing going, holy shit, you know, and I'm like, how long is this going to go on? And then finally it breaks and, and he goes back to shaking again, just back uh-huh. to his normal self it didn't say a word during that time it didn't he didn't say anything it just, it just showed you at me it showed you this is my theory because of the work you've done because this was after was this after the hospital and the prison this was after the prison yeah okay so you were further along in your career when this okay so this is my theory these predators they have the ability to scan almost to your soul level whatever this thing was knew that you had the authority and that you have this authority, it's a frequency that you carry whenever you do this kind of work. And so they can scan that, they can see it, they can read it. Like you print something out and you read it. So when those experiences happen to you, because this doesn't happen to everybody, Jerry, this God. only happens to people terrifying. like you that have the authority. He showed you what it was. It's, it was a part of the initiation. He saw where you were at. You know, it's almost like they sent this guy to you. Do you feel like you're being sent? You have to be being sent. It was weird because he was the only one that came in that night. What are the freaking odds of that? (laughs) You know, I never thought Mm. about that. Yeah. So it's like you're being initiated. Here's the initiation spectrum. This is when you first get triggered on this side. Okay. You first get triggered. You're in college. You're like, what the hell is going on? The predator's like, oh, we've got a live one here. This is a smart guy. Let's work with him. They boom. They released the sink or swim shaman. He comes down. He works with Jerry over the spectrum. They totally rework your frequency. You go through this paradigm shift and then you're starting to come to where you're fully initiated. Boom. Cue that other guy in. Now he's got to see it. He's got to see the full possession. So you've seen all the different phases of how this predator interacts, the snatch and grab, the catch and release. You're a great example of somebody that basically went through the alchemical transformation and initiation of the predator archetype because Mm. now it's literally showing you in your face this is what i look like in full possession mode 10 years i've had this person this is what it looks like jerry take notes and then and you know and then he basically goes back to shaking he did go back to shake but it wasn't over then we weren't we weren't done with each other on that at that at that point you know i i knew this guy knew stuff that I wouldn't be able to get anywhere else, mm-hmm. you know? And, and after that first thing came, it shook me up pretty bad. 
but then he came back to the his normal and his normal was fairly congenial uh -huh. for somebody who'd been using meth for 10 years so i asked him you know hear these things talk to them which is the first time i've ever heard any any patient in, in yeah yeah they usually just scare the shit out of you and paralyze you but, and they don't the, ever say anything they don't say anything so yeah. this guy actually heard them and if it was some anybody was going to hear him it was this guy who should have yeah. been dead eight years ago and and i said well you know what did they t after he came back and started shaking again i go and I, I gotta ask this what did they tell you you know so he said well they told me to go jump in front of trucks and i wouldn't be hurt and i said well what'd you do he said well i went out to the road and i, I jumped jumped in front of two 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 vehicles and i said well what happened he said i was hit i was thrown across the road he said i came to on the other side of the road and the the shadow people were surrounding me you know and they said get up you're not hurt and he said i got up and i wasn't hurt he said he did it again twice just wow. to prove it to himself he got hit again and then that thing came back again you know after he said he did he the second time he got hit Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden his eyes turned black again he stopped <laughs> shaking and there was mm -hmm. that thing again and it yeah. was it was staring at me so here was this goddamn steering contest going on mm -hmm. i'm looking it in the eyes it's looking me in the eyes and it's like this hatred this i've never felt a hatred like that before mm -hmm. it was just this deep endless hatred that just seemed to go forever you know and then i don't know it seemed to last forever and then all of a sudden boom it clicked off again and i mm -hmm. went i'm done <laughs> Yeah, I'm you're done. like, okay, I've had enough. <laughs> I've had enough. enough. I gotta get yeah. a drink. <laughs> so, so the psych nurse came and got this guy, and and then a, about two minutes later, she run back into my office and she said, "I can't deal with this guy. What what did you get?" So she could write her report. But that was one story with the shadow people. Another one is where a prisoner told me that they were he was experimenting with the shadow people to try to figure out what what they were. So you know, uh -huh. schizophrenics are curious about what the voices are. You know, they don't know what they are. You know, they don't know any more about them than than most people. They're curious, mm -hmm. too. So they're they're asking all kinds of questions. So here's this this one prisoner. He was they were doing meth. They saw the shadow people and they were wondering if meth was necessary to see them. What they do is they they get some two guys, the, the prisoner that I was dealing with and, and his friend. They get their meth. They get into a pickup truck. They drive out way into the desert to an Indian reservation and go down this dirt road into the middle of nowhere. Then they, they one guy injects <laughs> the meth and it's dark at this point. Mm -hmm. One guy injects and uh, he, he starts seeing the shadow people. So he goes to the other guy, he goes, you see that one over by the tree over there? And the other guy goes, no, I don't see him. Well, what about that one over by the bush? He goes, no, I don't see that either. So they determined that they needed the meth to see them, but that's, oh you know, God. that's not true. They it's... determined that. And then what, what these things do, and I don't know why this happens because the prisoners and, and several other prisoners told me the same thing. If they notice you looking at them, they start moving in on you. It's like, they know that you can see them. Mm -hmm. you know? So wow. while, while they were doing that, the other guy then shot up meth, he injected it and he started seeing them too. So he started conferring with the other guy saying, mm -hmm. okay, you see the one over there near the cactus. <laughs> And he goes, yeah, I see him. Well, what's he doing? Well, he's moving to the left. You know, they compared notes and they realized that they were both seeing the same thing, you know, and they were comparing notes and they go, what about that one over there? Yeah, I see him. Look at you. Da, da, da. And in the meantime, more of them are coming out of the desert and they mm -hmm. completely encircle them. While they're doing this, they see this whole circle all around their truck and they go, what the hell's going on? They jump in the truck and lock the doors and these things keep moving in on them. And the guy said, all of a sudden, the back of the truck went down and recoiled like somebody dropped a ton boulder in there. The whole yes. front of the truck went up, the back of the truck went down, and they're freaking. They're like, what is going on? And they turn around and they look in the back of the truck and they said it was full of shadow people. So that got my attention, too. It's like if they could if they could actually alter the physical condition of that yep. truck, if they could make that truck recoil, mm -hmm. what else could they do? You have to get the book time storms. There are so many instances where a car was lifted and then it was dropped. And these people reported things across time all over the planet. And there's instances where people are literally driving in their car this time storm overtakes them. And next thing you know, the one guy woke up 
300 miles away in a national park person found him walking in a trance and, and, and his wife reported him missing. The police were looking, they found his car and, and he wasn't there. He was on his way to a business meeting. He knew where he was going. Everyone knew where he was going. That's literally teleportation. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. How does that happen? And there's just cases and cases like that in this yep. book. I've heard some airplane pilots that, you know, all of a sudden would materialize somewhere hundreds of miles from where they were flying yeah. just in an, in an instant. And then they, they said it was like a circular thing of clouds that were yeah. just spinning. And that like, I call it atmosphere. It's like atmospheric quicksand. I mean, just think back in the day when the humans didn't know about quicksand, you're walking through the forest. Next thing you know, Tom's gone. Tom's gone. You think the devil took him. Meanwhile, he's in the quicksand. But it's like, you know, these people were walking around. Next thing you know, they walk right into a time storm. And the one case in missing 411 that is just just horrible to me is th this older man that was with a group of people he has problems with his legs so they're like sit here on this rock we'll go up there and we'll come back well he's gone okay and this isn't a scenario where they're way out this was in yellowstone park and it was in an area where there wasn't many places to hide okay like you could find him and two different people both independently heard a faint cry of help me from a man. One was a reporter who was at the national park, who was doing a story about something else, heard the commotion, came over. She's a reporter. She wants to see what's going on. She goes in the area as she's walking around. She hears this faint help me. She goes up to one of the rangers and is like, this is really weird, but I heard this guy say, help me. Well, he turns white and he was like, yeah, I heard the same thing. But there's wow. nowhere, wow. Jerry, wow. for this guy to be. He was yeah. literally in another dimension of space. And Time Storms is all about is she feels, she comes at it from a very scientific perspective, Randall's. And she feels this is natural earth phenomena that we just, we don't understand. It's science we don't understand yet. Well, and they say everything it. is happening at the same time. Yeah. And you know, that would be because, a good example of it. Yeah. Because we're in the physical universe. Everything is linear. But in the energetic universe where these entities operate, there is no time, there is yeah. no space, there is no matter. Everything, yeah. it's all happening right now. But yeah, that goes along with the, you know, it's a different time, it's a different space. These things come and go and live within that field that it's like a different field to them. But I do want to go over real quick the, the physical symptoms. So we did the environmental symptoms of time storms, but I'm going to run through these and see if anything comes up in it, time. It, Go ahead. Is this the uh, patterns you're talking about? That no, I'm not in the patterns no. yet. We're going to okay. get on that because I've got a half an hour. So we're going to use the last half hour to do the patterns. Right now, this is just the, I'm going to go over the rest of the time storms data that I have collected here. This is the physical symptoms. The witnesses reported feeling heavily medicated. And I call this darting. This is like when we dart an animal, we tag them and it's like catch and release. So they feel heavily medicated, dizzy, dazed. They feel detached, isolated, disoriented, experiencing timelessness and weightlessness, which we talked about, tingling sensation on the skin, like mm, goosebumps, that's... sunburn, they get sunburns, they get rashes, they faint because of the pressure sometimes and the heat, they get nauseous, they have auditory and visual hallucinations in time storms, severe headaches, vomiting, exhaustion, sluggishness, amnesia, confusion, paralysis, and clumsiness. Those are all the things associated and reported by time storms victims. And that it sounds like what some of your patients had to deal with. Well, to some of it. Yeah. The, the auditory and visual hallucinations. And then feeling yeah. medicated. Like you said, sometimes they would be drained. I mean, some of them yeah. that weren't medicated, maybe the draining would, would be more of a sedate, like a dizzy, dazed, sedated. Because yeah, like, death. like when you're really low energy. Yeah. Okay. You know, some of them, some of them were so drained, they couldn't even get out of bed in the morning to go eat breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. Sluggishness and exhaustion. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Those two for sure. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's good. I've always wanted to ask someone like you those questions to see if there was a comparison, because I, I actually do in my paper, talk about this comparison between all this phenomena. It's good to have you corroborate that at least a little bit, but yeah, we can now get into the self-defense portion of the talk where you, you can go into detail about these patterns 
that you were able to document. And then some of the things that the voices say in case if somebody does have this certain repeating pattern in their brain, then we can probably give them hope that they're not crazy. I do have the list of patterns here. The first one is negativity. That, that is the, the, the biggest overall one. It's like, all the voices that these people hear are negative for the most part. They can fake like they're angels, but eventually, you know, the truth turn, comes they, out. <laughs> the truth comes out. So the question is if psychiatry would get off their butts and take a look at this stuff and start talking to these people instead of just medicating them ceaselessly, they would find that the voices are consistently, unswervingly negative. Yeah, and like derogatory, question, insulting, abusive, destructive, all of that. Every negative thing you can think of consistently. So the question would be, is what is it that holds them to a consistently negative pattern? Why are they not random like hallucinations? Some of them positive, some of them negative, some yeah. of them neutral. Why are they being, what is it that holds them on that consistently negative path where they're always negative, they're always destructive? something is doing that yep. they're not random you know all, all these things the the, the patterns they they all fly in the face of what psychiatry is saying mm -hmm. and all this all these patterns are right there for them to look at you yeah. know i've already listed them for them i already it's already the work is done it's right here all they got to do is open their eyes and look the voices are anti-religious they don't like the religion i remember when patients started telling me that when they repeated the 23rd psalms oh, a yes. couple of them said that the voices reacted like worms thrown on a hot frying pan why would a hallucination do that why yeah. would a, why would a hallucination be anti-religious at all and they'll say there is no God. You're, you're wasting your time. I remember him telling one patient, Jesus couldn't even save himself. What makes you think he's going to change, save you? You know, they, they, they don't want him reading the Bible. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because some people, some patients know that, you know, one of the solutions is somewhere in the Bible. They just don't know how to get to it. So they've, they determine, well, I'm going to read the Bible, irrespective of what the voices say. And then the voices say, if you're going to read the Bible, you got to read it from cover to cover. You got to start at the beginning and read it all the way through. And then they get to that place in the Bible where this guy begat that guy, begat that guy, and it goes on for like 20 pages. And, and the voices jump in there and say, see, this is a bunch of bullshit. You know, why are you yeah. even wasting your time with this? And yeah. it's amazing how many of them they get to stop reading the Bible at that point. But they'll always say that. It's almost like they're all made from some cookie cutter where they're all programmed <laughs> to do this same stuff it comes pre-programmed that's uh, what i talk about the rules of engagement they all purchase the same license where yeah. they can come in here and feed they can't go off script they can't go outside of the bounds of this license like when you're hunting there's different types of hunting pheasant hunting doe hunting and there's different rules of engagement and parameters that you have to follow this is reminding me of this pattern is this is a sink or swim, snatch and grab, catch or release. This is something else. We'll have to come up with a different name because this is more of just feeding. These are, you know, like what we we're talking about a magnet. You can't see that magnetic force. But if you, you get a jar with iron filings and you put that magnet up there, now you can see it. But you're not actually seeing the, the magnetic force itself. You're mm -hmm. seeing its effect. Yep. And that's what these are. You can't see the voices themselves. You can't see these entities. But these are the effects they have on their victims. You mm -hmm. can see that. You're doing almost the exact same things that Jenny Randall's did in Time Storm. She's showing you the effects. And, and she's showing you the physical effects, the environmental effects. But, she, you know, she's like, I don't really know what this is. And sometimes it's moving. It's actual has a consciousness, but it doesn't talk to you. It, you know, it, it doesn't act like the missing 411 cases in the sense that it's deadly, but it, it's still destructive. And it's still a phenomenon that's that's acting similar to, you know, missing 411. You're all documenting these patterns of behavior and the way in which it filters through the human vessel. They are deadly. Schizophrenics have a suicide rate of three to five times that of the normal population. I've seen, I've seen the effects in the state hospital where one guy slid his wrist and he kept his mouth shut as the blood spurted all the way to the ceiling and he bled out. He didn't make a peep. They just found wow. him dead in the morning. The voices got him to yeah. finally drove him to that point. That's sad. It's really a shame. It's almost like some of them are soul hunters. They get you the, to that point where they've got you and they're not only going to end your 
your human existence, but they're going to take whatever's left. Yeah. It's almost like they were after his soul at that point, which is yeah. really sad if you think of it in that well, way. Well, they, they're they're all after they they can't get the person's soul, but they, they can can they they're, what they're after is to control the person's mind. Mm -hmm. So they they insert negative thoughts into the person's thought stream that sound just like your normal thoughts, but they they're not your intent you know that's one of the ways you can tell the difference is this isn't my intent to do these kind of things it's not yeah. my intent to beat somebody up or shoot somebody yeah. and these voices are telling them to do that yeah. you know they're they they can't what they're after is the creation of that negative emotional energy yep that's the next one foster yeah. and create negative emotion and <laughs> they will do anything to do that it, it they they there's no holds barred you know, they they have complete access to your memory. They can pull up every rotten thing you've ever done and rub it in your face until you start generating that negative emotional energy. Yeah. And they'll, we've all had that. I don't get voices, but I'll get pictures. I'll get the uh, movie that plays out and it'll be of something stupid that I did when I was a kid. Right. And I'm like, that's a normal thing that a seven year old does. So it doesn't affect me <laughs> because you have to go through those experiences as a child. If you're a human being. That's what happens. And so when I used Sherry's, that's a lie. When I had that image come in, I finally realized how to use it. And I said to whatever it was, was around me. I said, you've never been human because you went through my memory, like a Rolodex. You popped this out. You shoved it in my brain. You brought it up to the surface. But what you don't realize is that is a normal thing. That is a normal, embarrassing thing that every six-year-old on this planet has probably, or seven, eight-year-old. So I understand that as a 46-year-old woman, that that is normal behavior. That's part of the development process of a human being. And now I know you've never been human. So you think that's going to work and it doesn't because I'm a mature adult. I, I can outsmart that. And so there has been times where they've actually gone through the Rolodex and put in something that maybe happened in the corporate environment. I'm 20, 30 years old. Of course, everyone's going to do something stupid at one point in time. Let's be mature about this. Okay. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done it. Nice try again. It, it's not going to bother me because mm -hmm. that is a normal thing that can happen in a corporate environment. Yeah. You know? They try to get their claws in you and they do that yeah. by, by capturing your attention. So what schizophrenia is, it's a spiritual battle for your attention. And they're trying like to that. direct your attention to negative things. To what they can then feed to, off to, of. Yes. Yeah. That leads it, into the next thing with this energetically drain the victims. Yeah. Doing that constantly. So if I wasn't able to flip that switch after listening to you guys doing this research, writing this paper, then it was like, oh, this is how this works. This is how the technology works. I can switch this on. I can switch this off. And so, you know, every once in a while it'll happen. And I remember what you guys teach people. And then I just say, you've never been human. That is a normal situation. I will not be held responsible for that because it's petty and it's stupid. And probably a million people have done it. <laughs> I think you'd find the interview that I just posted on YouTube with uh, a fellow. He wanted to be called Anon. But he's a okay. mechanical engineer now, but at the age okay. of around 25, he had a complete psychotic break, was hospitalized oh, wow. for four weeks. Mm -hmm. and, and he's somebody I could put you in touch with, too. Okay. But, so he was hospitalized for four weeks and the voices were telling him something about something to the effect of your, your, you know, you humans are disgusting. You, your mouth is uh, ugly or da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And he, he re reared back and he said, God gave me this mouth. Take it up with him. And they just shut up. So yeah. he was one of those ones that kept the voices at a distance, mm -hmm. you know, because almost all of them struggled to figure out what these voices are. And if they believe that they are the voices, mm -hmm. it's the voices want, they want yeah. them to believe that the voices are, are well, you know, who at they first, are. At first, you're just thinking that, yeah, this is you. This is you remembering something. You have to listen to somebody like you and somebody like Sherry so that you start, you know, I have a background in martial arts. I used to teach self-defense classes when I was younger. The first thing you teach is how to change your mindset, to change your mindset, to be aware of your surroundings. And all we're doing right now is teaching people how to be aware of your metaphysical surroundings. You have to take not only your environment, but now you have to stretch into your metaphysical environment, but people are smart. Once you realize, oh, 
There's a metaphysical environment, whatever you want to call it, a matrix. Then McTaggart calls it the field. You know, Rupert Sheldrick, he has a mm -hmm. name for it. All these people, they have different names for it. It's the same damn thing. Once you flip that switch in your mind, then you can start being aware of it. And then, yeah. you know, like you did, it takes you seven years. You build up the awareness to it. Then the universe sends somebody to you. <laughs> And you shows know, you these it's dark been pretty eyes. much doing it. And, yeah. And then next thing you know, so anyone, you know, we, we can all do this. You just have to flip that switch, start becoming aware of it. And then like you did be mature about it. When something happens, don't dismiss it and, and have a rational conversation with yourself. This could, this possibly be happening. That's let's do what Sherry and Jerry well, tell me to do and you, test you, it for yourself. You know that is one of the things I tested with Carlos Castaneda from okay. the start because things were getting weird at the state hospital castanata is kind of strange himself but what he wrote jived with me i mean i could feel it uh -huh. and one of the things he said was that if something happens to you that doesn't fit w with your conception of of what reality is you, you'll blot it out or forget it you yeah. know it, it, you just won't allow it to fit and 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 that's yeah. like a, a reality's mechanism of keeping you in the state that you should be in. Because you almost woke up too soon to something that you weren't, you know, like Carl Jung says, be aware of unearned wisdom. That's reality's way of protecting you from unearned wisdom, because you can go into a psychotic state if you get woken up too soon spiritually, especially when you're doing the kind of stuff that you're doing and what Carlos Castaneda is talking about. When you were on that spectrum and it's like, we're pushing Jerry along like this. Well, if you had seen those black eyes and that guy back here at like year seven, I don't know if you might've, you, know, you might not have pushed along as you did, but it's like reality kept you where, you know, it's going to meet you where you're at these synchronicities and this type of alchemical, you know, initiation, it's going to meet you where you're at. It's going to keep you on path. It's going to send these things to you. Like Carlos says, when it can, and when you can't handle something, it's going to wipe it. That's where I learned to take notes when something strange happened <laughs> to write it down somewhere, because if, if I didn't, I would lose it. Okay. You've got to make a book of this journal of notes. <laughs> You got to find it, Jerry. I've got, I've got story after story after story here, but you okay. Know. You've got to do a book on just stories, please. Uh, Come uh, on. You can do it. You, uh, you owe it to us. I've, I've got it like half done. And then after two years of working on this book, it was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've been there. Yeah. I know. But yeah, I've got you some amazing. I got some amazing stories. I mean, all just, right. I'm going to push you now that we're in contact. Oh, that book's sure, coming. Then, now, Sherry and you are both going to be on. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. So we've got, I've only got 10 more minutes. So let's hurry okay. up. We'll go through these. And because I really want people to understand. So they get louder after sunset. That's Which is pretty strange. interesting. You know, they, with the, while well, I was working in a, uh, what old folks place, geriatric center, Yeah. they, they called it uh, sundowner syndrome. Oh, where they would yeah. start getting crazy after sunset. Does the that voices... happen in the dementia facilities too? The, the dementia, like grandpa I, I, was in one and at night, yeah. they, get, yeah, they, get, yeah. they get day and nights messed up. Yeah, they get so, crazy. Yeah. So oh, the voices okay. are the same thing. They get louder after sunset for some reason. Did you notice this in the prison systems as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. This was a pattern you saw across yes. hospital, these are all, this is, nursing these are all homes. Okay. From, from, from the East Coast, from Georgia to Iowa, to, to Arizona. It, irrespective of time or place or institution, all these patterns were going on in people that had never met one another ever. Yes. Yeah. You okay, know? good. Then the next one is the voices get louder when ignored. Right. And okay. psychiatry will tell them, oh, just ignore just them. Ignore They're hallucinations. It. And it makes and it freaking worse. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it worse. Okay. Foster self-destructive behavior. See, and that's one of the things that's really interesting because the, the human being, the prime directive for the human being is to survive to do things to survive and be happy. That's the prime mm -hmm. directive. But in schizophrenia, that is turned around 180 degrees and the, the mind turns on itself. It turns on the patient. Mm -hmm. It's no longer a survival mode. It's a destructive mode. And schizophrenics are some of the most self-defeating, self-destructive, destructive people on the planet. Yeah. 
And that, you know, yeah, that totally goes against life in general. Yeah. You don't agree, see yeah. dogs turning on themselves or biting themselves yeah. or doing yeah. things that are destructive. The next one is foster isolation. Yeah. They want the person isolated. They don't want anybody involved with them. They want them locked in their room by themselves, just them and the voices. They don't want okay. mothers interfering. They don't want girlfriends, no family, no, no, friends, family, no, no nobody. Nothing. They just want them by themselves. Okay. The worst thing you could do to a schizophrenic is isolate them. Gotcha. And then, so that goes along with the next one, which is they want to demand the attention right. of them they, all the time. They yeah. And we're talking about the parasites. Attention. Yeah. Right. Okay. And maneuver for increased control over the victims, which goes right along with all those, yep. those other two things. Gaslighting, which goes along with it. Let's see, manipulating perception. That's they interesting. They man manipulate perception. You know, they'll take a, a neutral statement and turn it negative. You know, yeah. oh, those people are talking behind your back. You know, and you look yes. and the guys, they're talking. Or, oh, those people are looking at you and you start, they start looking around. And, Meanwhile, and they're not even looking at you. They're you know, not looking at you. They're, 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 they could be looking uh, at something behind you. Or talking all, about know. something totally yeah. different. They, they, they interpret and change perception that people are against you. Okay. They have complete access to the schizophrenic's memory. We talked about that. They almost go through your Rolodex. Yep. You know, and they can... They can kind of push your buttons, demand the victim, not tell others about their presence, Right, right. You which tell is anybody, very easy to do. And, and, and demand, they, they don't want to be discovered. They, yeah. they want to stay down under. So they tell them not to tell anybody about them at all. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, and that now I, is this available on your website? All of these, cause we're not going to be able to get through all of, there's 20, yeah, I, I think 28 or 29 of them. Okay. I, yeah. I cause you sent this to me, but I'm pretty sure it is. So I'm going to skip down to like, okay, this is a good one. Boredom is bad. An idle mind is the devil's playground. Right? Yes, there's that exactly. Saying. Exactly. Okay. okay. Selective forgetting. What the hell is that, Jerry? Well, they do something and they forget it. You know, they do something bad. They, they have no memory that they did it. Oh, well, especially Susan, with yeah, Susan Martinez talks about yeah, that. Especially with like psychotic killers, they go, oh, I, yes. I don't remember, I don't remember doing that. Oh my God, you've got to read her book. Yeah, she has the transcripts of them either in court or being interrogated, and mm -hmm. they're like, "That was not me." You're thinking it, that they're just saying that, but they no. sound honest. They're like, "Yes, I they are honest. Did not do that. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, they the didn't one do it. Yeah, yeah, the one serial killer was like, "There's no way I could ever, ever do that." And I how mean, many he times, was adamant. You know, how many yeah. times do you hear these guys go to court and say the voices told me to do it? So they Sad. send them to they send them to the prison. Shit, you know, I didn't, I didn't along put those with their two together. Okay, let's see. Destruction of positive self concept. Okay, we we kind of went we went over that one. Let's see. I'm gonna skip to. Oh, this is a good one. Attempt to pull their victim away from consensual reality. Yes, that's an advanced they, they, one. <laughs> they, they try to suck them into their reality and their description of what reality is and what's going on oh. their description of what people are saying their description of the interpretation of events yeah it's which almost is, like they're becoming the interpreter right for everything they, they want to be the interpreter for everything wow. they want control of that being and they don't relent they're relentless that's an advanced form of behavioral science see confusion as a means of instilling negative suggestions We've talked about that aversion to anything positive or beautiful. Yeah. They don't want them being Jeez. happy. They don't want them doing anything enjoyable. They don't want them reading positive spiritual books. They, 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 they don't want any happiness. They don't want the guy smiling, laughing, joking. None of that. If, if you walked into their apartment, it's probably a mess and it's probably filthy. We can take this stuff. Literally. I try and keep my space very clean. Um, and organize. Everything has to have its place and has to have multiple purposes because I live in a small house. There's a reason for that, but that can transfer over into a metaphysical reason. I'm just trying to give an example to somebody who's not psychotic as a practical way is that's a good idea to keep your house in order. It's like feng shui. You want to foster the, the movement of energy through your home and you want it to be positive, keep things clean and tidy and organized. Is that, would that be the yeah. place? Yeah. Okay. Nice. All right, Jerry. Well, this was absolutely amazing. I know we didn't get into the actual things that they say, the patterns that you guys wrote down, but with Sherry, we listed a bunch of those at the very end of the call. If somebody listens to her, they're going to get everything. Do you want to 
let anyone know where they can contact you before we officially stop recording? My website at jerrymarzinski.com. Okay. And I will, I'm going to get all that information from you and put it in the show notes. You've got a website, your book is available. You can order it through the website. Okay. Or you could get, or you could order it through Amazon. Okay. But the, we got articles, we got testimonials, we've got stories, we've got, You've got all, a ton of all resources. The videos. Yeah. yeah. And then do you have a YouTube channel as well? Uh, yeah, I got There's... a YouTube I got a YouTube channel. Okay. I got, it's on web it's on uh, YouTube, it's on BitChute, it's on Rumble. Okay. Uh, we got all these all the videos are there. Okay. You you have so much information out there that you could just do a quick internet search. And all of your interviews come up. I definitely look forward to staying in touch. And thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. So I'm going to end the show right now. And thanks again, but stay on the line and we'll keep talking. All right. Bye everyone. Thank you.